It's not even a question of figuring out how to scale, though. They, they know how to do it. I, I think it's um, that whole point of CARP wanting to vet each customer, you know, and to, like, decide, is this use case one we want to pursue? And having that as a cultural value, whereas, like, someone like an Andy Jassy would say, hey, we can do that and we can scale. The way we're going to do that is we're going to have a terms of service. And anyone who violates it or not, anyone we don't want on our platform, we'll just kick them off, you know, like. That's what a terms of service is don't, for. Well, don't you think Palantir can't just do a TOS because, like he said in the same interview, we're the first ones that decided to not build a Muslim database. Like the tech is too powerful to just. That's a government job, dude. I'm talking about commercial, bro. Hmm. Okay. Okay. Companies don't have guns and they don't have fucking police forces and they're not going to go out and like imprison you. So like that's a whole different set of arguments. Right. Um, and I totally get why you want to vet the use case on the government side. I'm all for that. On the commercial side, though, it's just kind of weird. Like, bro, there's an industry standard solution. It's called terms of service. You don't even need to violate them. You just get to keep kick people off because they write those things to be completely, you know, amorphous. They can mean whatever you want them to mean at the time, you know. So that's how you that's how you maintain control over a platform. Typically, is you spread terms of service. You onboard people through, you know, automation. You still have control. It's not like the CEO can't be involved if there's a violation. And people want to like make a case to the CEO as to why someone should be kicked off. But you can't be an upfront barrier. And so part of this just gets down to like understanding the role that CARP wants to play there, whether or not um, he's willing to let commercial scale on its own without him, without it. It's almost like it's his baby, you know? He doesn't want to let go of his baby. I say separate it. Just call a commercial. I have like, 100% in agreement. You know who yeah. needs to run commercial? It's Sean. Yeah. Sean yeah. would crush commercial. He's the Andy Jassy in waiting over there, dude. Like mm -hmm. he would take commercial and turn that thing into a beast, you know? Yeah. Like uh, here's a good, here's a good thing to think about with Palantir. So I think about this all the mm -hmm. time. How long would it take Palantir if they doubled their commercial customers every year to get to the same customer count as Snowflake? Snowflake has like 4,000. So yeah. Yeah. About three, four years. Yeah. That's no, fucking more. nuts, right? More they, than well, that. Well, they only have, how many that. customers do they have? 200? They have like every year. I know I'm asking you to do math a bit, but that's it more. That's like eight. That's like eight yeah. years. You no. son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like four. Add like 150 plus 10. Right. Um, like a podcast right. from three months ago. And I did that. It's going to take a long time. This is. Um, it is the proud product of the Rutgers University system. Uh, I just want to let y'all know. You know, you know 800, 1600, 3200, right? So like. My like, mom is a math teacher, bro. That's how. All right, is. but but it's gonna take them a long time. We're talking years, and that's assuming yeah. Snowflake and Databricks to stop growing too, right? So like, yeah. that should scare everyone. I should be like, what the fuck? Like, why are you guys growing so slowly? That's nuts. Okay, and that so, assumes so, so, a hundred percent year over year customer growth in commercial. Yeah, agreed. So, th in this case, it is kind of scary that it would take them multiple multiple years to get to that customer count of like a Snowflake. Yeah. But one of the things that we have, which leads into the super chat, Coach Rep can't probably talk on this because of conflicts of interest, but Chris can. The price of the stock is incredibly low. And even though it'll take them a long time to grow at this level at seven bucks to get a 3x on your money, right? Call it $21, $23, I think is very reasonable, even if they're not growing like crazy. So, Chris, what are your thoughts on Gabe's super chat? Uh, the price that you think is the absolute rock bottom that you think is ridiculous for Pound here? Well, I mean, based on my estimations, if they're trading below cash value and they're still generating cash flow, they're fine. Like right now, we're pretty much close to a bottoming, in my opinion, based on just purely valuation. But that takes that doesn't take into account a further slowdown in commercial growth and other growth. Right. So I do think that there is room for Palantir to expand its growth tar um it's total growth, like revenue growth, probably towards the end of the year, because I do think that eventually some government contracts are finally going to start to materialize and pay for them. Also, there is something that Kevin O'Leary said, which is kind of interesting, which was how Palantir has been kind of like um, sidelined a little bit because of like who's in charge of the government right now. Right. So everyone knows the midterms at this point. The Republicans are going to come in and shellac the crap out of the de Democrats. You know, just the unpopularity of a lot of the stuff that's going on. You know, if a Republicans come back into power and you see Peter Thiel being so politically, um, uh, what's the word, politically uh, active, 
and supporting some of the candidates that are out there right now, if they end up getting into power, then of course they're going to be advocating from the Hill for Palantir in terms of government spending. So that government spending might end up boosting uh, revenues in the future. And I think that could be a nice driver for Palantir. But here's the thing, the valuation would have to be more like a defense contractor, not a SaaS, like a hyper growth SaaS company. So if you take that into consideration, 15 to $20 billion is probably a fair valuation on Palantir. But here's the thing, if you're trying to, if, that would mean that there is no room for Palantir to become like the next like Salesforce. It's all about execution at this point. So I think right now, if they don't execute, they're gonna they're gonna be like a niche uh, a niche player, right? And if you look at most of the niche software players, right, they're not exactly like like you look at late Lados, right? Lados is one of the largest government contractors out there. They're not that big, and they they and they have so much revenue that's already coming in. So. I would say that their valuation has to be measured. I think a lot of people, they think that they, I want to give Palantir the benefit of the doubt and give them like a hyper growth SaaS valuation, but I can't. And based on, I can't, that's the other thing. And the other thing is their, their compensation model is heavily tied to issuing um, shares, which it's kind of a double-edged sword in that that kind of like helps you save cash and that lets you be free cash flow positive very easily. But at the same time, you're kind of diluting shareholders, right? No matter how much you say, oh, well, you know, di dilution doesn't matter. Dilution does matter. Look at your share count, right? At $10 when it IPO'd versus $10 right now, look at, look at the market cap, right? So as those share counts expand out, that means that further growth in the share price is going to be much harder, right? So if your price target is one day, uh, this is going to be a, a $200 stock and there's 2 billion shares outstanding, that would make Palantir a $400 billion market cap company, which is really hard to get to because on top of it, they've been issuing so many shares. So, so I think right now we're, we're at a point where Palantir is fairly valued, but are they going to execute if they do execute and they do well and they start to you know re re re-energize their growth a little bit then yeah we could definitely see palantir start to move higher you know in in a in a in a short-term way but i do think right now they have a lot of execution risks which is why a lot of a lot of um, analysts are not valuing palantir nearly as high as they were previously right so at $20, if they were still growing at 50, 60% per year, dude, they should easily be worth $20, but they're not. I'm sorry, they're not. So what are you going to do? You know, they, they're missing their own targets. They're missing their own targets. Let's talk a little bit about like what that, um... okay, so I would say like markets will make you pay, right? So like the free market, the great thing about the free market is like, it's a really good judge of like whether you're right or you're wrong. And if you're wrong, the market is going to make you fucking pay, right? So, like, that's a really good indicator of whether something's working out or not. But it's still never a check on the CEO, right? Because, like, the CEO can do whatever they want to do regardless, you know? And um, if they believe they're right, they're going to they're gonna do what they think is right, right? Regardless of even what the market is telling you is wrong, right? So what's the out for Palantir? It's a bit like thinking about the Ukraine war, right? And, and Putin. Like, what's the off-ramp for Putin, right? Like, how does he get out of that war? You know, it's the same thing for CARP. Like, what's the off ramp for CARP? How, how, how does the CEO who's at war with the market get an off ramp? And I'm like, dude, the off ramp is simple. Split the fucking company up. Have Sean run commercial. You stay face and run government. Can keep saying all the things you've been saying. Keep operating that company the way you've been operating it. You're focused on government. There's a whole lot of philosophical debate to be had there. You'll love it, CARP. But over here is commercial. And Sean's going to run that like fucking Andy Jassy in AWS. That's the off ramp, right? Because the CEO well, is why not can't going they do that without wrong. splitting the company? Why can't because they the CEO is never going to say he's fucking wrong? He has no other out. What's the out going to be? I quit. <laughs> Carp's going to fucking quit. No, because you can't replace him. He's he's not replaceable. Right? Yeah, and Palantir is worse because you have those F class shares. That's At what least, I'm talking about. Is the yeah, F class shares yeah, make him. You yeah. cannot replace Carp. Well, cannot why replace why can't Carp just be like Sham? You're head of commercial, even though I'm still the CEO. And like they push have you seen the corporate structure between like AWS and Amazon? 
Yeah, so Amazon's the parent company, and then yeah, and they have other yeah, small yeah, companies. Yeah, exactly. Too, and right? they separate everything and yeah. get your own staff, your own, you know, everything's completely separated. Yeah. So. You have your own accounting, your own CFO, your, your right own salespeople. Yeah. yeah. And, e and it would actually stop, yeah. it would stop with this bullshit that they have to encounter every time they go to yeah. a fucking conference about like, oh, you're a spy company. Oh, you're this or you're that. Like, that's not us, man. This is Palantir commercial. Like, we have nothing to do with that. <laughs>